Perfect. All right. So if you have a look here, the question is specifically asking us for all the males. So now we can go and we can get all the male values from our table. So for example, there's a male value, there's a male, there's a male value. And what I've done is because these values over here were not given, I had to go and work them out. So I'm just going to go back to the memo again. All right. So I've gone and converted those. Those three values that were missing, remember there are four values that are missing from the table, but the one is a female, so we don't need to convert that one. So I'm just going to go and I've gone and converted those three values. And now that I've converted the three values, I can go and actually work out the median weight loss for those values. So I remember with median, we need to arrange the, the values for median from the smallest value to the biggest value. So I've gone and I've arranged them. And then when I've done that, I can go and just double check as well. So use your time in a test or an exam. And you will see there that there are, there's one male, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 males that have entered this competition. So now that you know that, you can obviously then just go and double check. Do I have that amount when I've arranged my data values? So when I arrange it, I can just double check. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I've got my 12 values over there. And remember, again, median is arranged from smallest to largest. A lot of learners, uh, learners forget to arrange it, so you're throwing away marks there. So just be very careful of that. And then because we've got 12 values, remember that there are two values that are going to be in the middle. So we'll have 23.7 as well as 24.95 in the middle. And because there are two values in the middle, you then have to go and add the two together and divide it by two. And then you get a total of 24,325. The question is saying that you need to verify if the statement is valid. And her statement said that the median was 33.8. And as you can see there, this is not 33.8. So again, that final mark for saying that a statement is not correct. Again, it's so important to make sure that you answer these questions because otherwise you're throwing away all these marks. So if you do not answer the question by saying that she's, it's not fair, the statement was not valid, then you're going to lose one mark. And these things obviously add up as you go along. So please be mindful of that. Another thing I just want to put a little bit of emphasis on is the use of a calculator because a lot of learners do make this mistake as well, seen it over the few years of marking. So what learners do is they take the 23.70 plus the 24.95 divided by two. But the problem is that they just type it in on the calculator as they say it. So 23.7 plus 24.95 divided by two. So they go and they type it in on the calculator like that. So when they type it in on the calculator like that, bod mass obviously kicks in. And what, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to add the two together and then divide by two. But what bod mass goes and does is it obviously first divides the 24.95 divided by two, and then it adds on the 23.7. So that answer will not be the same. I'm just going to quickly write down what the answer will read you'll get 36,175. So as you can see, that is not the correct way to do it. So just be mindful of that. If you do put it in on your calculator, you know, you put it in as is. If you're going to put it in like this, um, please make sure then that you put your brackets in the correct place, which actually needs to be over there. So especially if you're not using a scientific calculator with a fraction button, for example, maybe you're just using the basic four function calculator and please make sure that you first add the two values together and then divide it by two. All right. So just the last question over here, and then I can just move on. So the last question, 2.1.3, it says compare by calculating the interquartile ranges of males and females who participated in these two weight loss programs and then comment on it. So I just want to go through this because it's just a reminder of the box and whisker plot again. So if you have a look at 
the box and whisker flight, which was also then given in the in the test or in this question. And this is a paper two from 2015, so quite an old question. So if you go and you work at art, you will see the interquartile range. And again, I'm just going to remind you what an interquartile range is. So the interquartile range is your Q3 minus your Q1. So your upper quartile minus your lower quartile. So the males is 34,63 for Q3 and 16,52 for Q1. And there is your female values as well. So all you're going to do for five marks, quite a bonus in my opinion, is you're just going to minus Q3 and Q1 from each other for males as well as for the females. And then they ask us to comment on it as well. Um, Alishu? Yes. Um, Haley uh, asked if you could please zoom in. All right. And Masi Bambisane asked if you could please repeat question 2.12. Super one, two. Yes. All right, great. Okay, so maybe if we just zoom in slightly. Okay, so let's just quickly then finish off this question and then I'll go back to 2.1.2. So like I said, all you're going to do is you're going to minus the male and female Q3 and Q1 together. And um, there's the male values, there's the female values. So we're going to minus the two from each other. And when you minus the two from each other, uh, oh, sorry, rather the Q3 minus the Q1 for males and for females, and we need to make a conclusion as well. The conclusion is that the female interquartile range is more than the male interquartile range. And that's your conclusion. Okay, so if we then go back to 2.1.2, I'm just going to put the table back on, just so we can see where exactly it is that we need to put a bit of focus. Okay. So 2.1.2, let's just go back to what the statement was. So the statement was that the median weight loss of all the males was 33.8 kilograms. The question is asking us just to verify, showing all calculations, whether or not a statement is valid. So if we have a look at the table, now remember the question is asking us for the median. Now we all know how to work out the median. We just simply arrange the data values from smallest to biggest, and then we work out the middle value of that data set. So if you have a look here, this is about all the males. So it's not just specific to USA or not just specific to South Africa, it's all the males. So if you have a look at the table, you've got quite a few values for the males, okay? So there's a male value over there, there's a male value over there, and here we've also got three male values as well, but as you can see, they are blank, they've got ellipses on there. That means that we need to go and actually work them out. There's also one over here for the female that's also been left out. But for this question, it's obviously not relevant. So these three values here, we need to go and work out. Now, as you can see there, this is the pounds lost column, and this is the kilograms lost column. So we need to first go and work out what those values are in pounds, which makes sense because they've gone and given us the equation over here, so the converting factor. So when you see that, the learner can realize that, wait a minute, I obviously need to use this. So again, if I have to go have a look at the memo, what my steps were, I have to first go and convert those three values from pounds to kilograms. And how I do that is I need to multiply it by 0.4535592 because one pound is the equivalent of 0.45 um, kilograms. So it's about half a kilogram more or less. So now I go and I work out those three values. So there's the three values. So those three values there are the three missing values from the table. So now that I've gone and I've worked it out, I can go back to my table. And this is why this question is for seven marks, because there is quite a little bit of work that the learner will need to do. So I'm going to go back to my table. And when I go back to my table, I need to go and find all the male values. So there's a male value over there. There's a male value over there. These three that were missing that I've now gone and worked out. This one over here. And then obviously on the South African side, we also have some male values that we need to find. So when you find all those values, you'll see that there's a total of 12 values from this table that I need. Remember, this one is not part of it. So there's 12 values, 
all I need to do now is I need to arrange them from smallest to largest because remember that's how you work out the median. So like I said, you're taking a skill that you've learned in grade eight already, working out the median, and you're just carrying it through and um, using it in a little bit more of a complicated question. Complicated because you had to first go and do some conversions and find it from a table. So you're taking the skills that you've learned from a younger age and you're using it now to answer your grade 12 paper. So now we can go and we can arrange it. Remember, median is from smallest to largest. So we're going to arrange, we've gone and placed all the values there, we've arranged it from smallest to largest. And then when you do that, you can double check there's 12 values on your answer and there's 12 values in the question. So I should be on the right track. When I do this, I see that I've got two values in the middle. So I've got 23.7 in the middle, as well as 24.95 in the middle. So because there's two values in the middle, I have to go and divide it by two. So when I divide it by two, I get a total of 24.33. And as I said before, the question asked whether or not this person was correct. You had to um, verify whether her statement is valid. So she argues, um, Tim Becker argues that the median was 33.8 kilograms. Now, as you can see, it's clearly not um, 33.8. So therefore, her statement is not correct, or you could say not valid. So as I said, that extra mark over there, that one mark, a lot of learners just lose because they forget to actually go and make a conclusion. And another thing I just mentioned that I'll quickly go through again is how you type it in on your calculator. You must remember that you are first adding the values together over there, and then you are dividing by two. Because what some learners do is they type it in on the calculator like this without any brackets, and then what the calculator does is it first divides it by 2, the 24.95, and then it adds on the 23.7, which gives you an answer of 36.175, which is obviously not the same answer as above. So please be mindful of that. I have seen that as quite a common mistake. The other mistake is the learners forget to arrange the values. All right. So that was just something I wanted to put a little bit of emphasis on. So um, is there anything else there with regards to data that you'd like me just to go through again before we continue? Okay. So I'm assuming there's nothing else there. So if that's the case, and there's just, um, before we go on to day two's work, there's just one thing I want to go through about the graphs that we didn't get to on Tuesday that I just think is a little bit important as well. So I'm going to go through this question fairly quickly, but I just want to put emphasis on one or two things um, regarding this, this section of work. So this is something that you generally see in paper two, but like I said, the papers are slightly different this year. So don't know which paper you might see it in, but the layout I would assume would still be the same. So how this works is this question is asking us or, or, or stating rather that um, this pro print hires out photocopy machines and they also offer three contract options. The three contract options are shown in the graph on the answer sheet. Now the answer sheet is exactly that. It's a piece of paper with an English side as well as an Afrikaans side. And this is inside of your question paper. So please, just one or two things that I feel I need to mention is that you need to make sure, first of all, that you have a pencil to answer this question. Because if you make a mistake, you cannot just ask for another answer sheet. Your next best bet is then to flip it over and go to the Afrikaans side. Or if you're an Afrikaans speaking learner, then to flip it over and go to the English side and then hope that you get it right when you draw it again. So please make sure that you have a pencil. The next important thing that you need to make sure that you do is that you actually go and put this answer sheet inside of where you've gone and written your answers down. Because remember, you're allowed to take your question paper home once you're finished with, with your exam for the finals now. So what some of the learners do is they take the answer sheet and they put it back into their question paper and they don't staple it or put it inside of their answer booklets and then they go home and then they've left the school and then they've realized that the answer sheet is still inside the question papers. So now obviously we can't give you those marks because you're sitting with that piece of paper at home. 
The other thing is some learners go and they write it in inside of their answer book. They don't answer it on this answer sheet. Maybe they've made a mistake, for example. Unfortunately, we do not mark that. So it's very, very important that you practice these answer sheets and that you make sure that you do it in pencil so that you can erase if you've made a mistake. So the first um, question is just asking us to write down the number of pages at the point where contract two and contract three cost the same. So again, I don't really want to go through these questions because I'd really like to start with the maximum measurements part as well. Otherwise, we won't get to all of it. But there was just a few things that I wanted to to speak about. So the first couple of questions is just asking us um, to, to write out information based on, on what we see. But what I do want to just um, spend some time on quickly as well is 3.1.4. Um, we need to draw on the same grid on the answer sheet another line graph to show the cost charged by Copy King. So the graph has three lines on it already, and you need to just place that fourth line onto the graph. So I'm just gonna pull the memo out again, just to show you again where the marks is allocated. That's really all I want to just focus on with this question, but please take some time and go through this question um, at home. Okay, so if you again have a look at where the marks is allocated, um, so the line that you had to draw was the one that starts at zero. And the reason why it starts at zero is because if they didn't copy anything, then they don't have to charge anything. So at zero. And that is something that the learners forget to do is they forget to start the graph at zero if it needs to start at zero. So if it's an income graph, obviously if you didn't sell anything, you can't make anything. But let's say the first point that was given to you was at um, you know, 500 and 500, then the learner goes and they plot the mark or the point, but they forget about the fact that it needs to actually start at zero if it's an income for example so this one is the same it needs to start at zero so there's a mark for the starting point there's a mark for the ending point and then there's a mark for actually going and connecting your line together so in this case it's not necessary to go and plot all the points in between you just need a starting point and an ending point and you can draw the line through that's a nice way just to save a little bit of time um, so yeah, so please just make sure, again, if you've got a ruler, and that's also very important to have your ruler, make sure that this is drawn properly. Because for me, this is um, an underestimated section in a test. The learners don't attempt this properly. Um, they don't use a ruler. Um, they walk out with the answer sheet in the, inside the question paper, or they do it on the actual answer book instead of you. So please just be, just be mindful of some of these, these tips that I'm giving. Okay, so that is all for just to finish off the data and also the drawing of the graphs. Is there any question about the graphs that you have? Otherwise, I need to move on to the maps and measurements section. Okay, so if there's nothing, then I'm going to start with the maps and plans. So we are officially starting with the paper two concepts for now, for this, for today's session. Okay, so like I said before, paper two, brand new way of um, asking these questions or, or laying out these papers rather. So paper two will be on maps and plans with measurements, and again, with a little bit of probability in between. So if you want to be preparing so long for paper two, then you are more than welcome to download paper ones as well as paper twos. And then remember that you can do some questions from paper one and paper two on maps and plans. And then from there, you can obviously go to measurements. What's also very important as well, grade 12s, is that you cannot just practice paper ones, and then you go to paper two question and you see the seven, eight, nine marks and you're like, oh no, it's fine. I don't need this. You definitely need to practice your paper twos as well. It's so important because that's your higher level type questions, you know, the old way of asking these, these question papers. Um, a lot of the learners, they like to answer paper one because it's easier and it's two and three mark questions with a few more difficult questions. So then when they get to paper two, they're sort of over it. But it's so important that you need to make sure that you practice as many paper two style questions as well. 
Okay, so let's move on to maps and plans and then also get to measurements as well. So I'm not going to um, go through all these questions just for time purposes, but I will put a little bit of emphasis on one or two things. Okay, so the first um, question we're going to have a look at is um, question 4.1.1, which has an extra B. So this was the strip map, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay, so let's just have a look at the strip map. Again, a question or a map that learners don't always tend to enjoy. So what a strip map is doing is it's just showing us distances um, between towns. So this is quite a nice map just for planning purposes. Just want to zoom out a little bit. Okay, it's already zoomed out. Okay, let me just move it out a little bit so you can see the whole map. So as you can see, this is what our strip map looks like, and there's also a key at the bottom. So you can see that it's got little distances as well between the different towns. So you can plan nicely. If you're someone like me that needs a bathroom break quite regularly, then it is something nice to see because then you can plot your way and figure out which towns that you want to stop at. Maybe just to go for a cup of coffee on the way that's the long drive or if you need the bathroom or whatever the case is, it's just a nice way um, to see it and also the layout. Um, if you have a look, um, the left side versus the right hand side, the one, the left hand side is now obviously heading towards PE. Okay, you can see the top that says strip charts of the route from Carlsberg to Port Elizabeth, distances in kilometers. So on the left-hand side, we're going from Colesburg to PE. And on the right-hand side, we're then going from Port Elizabeth to Colesburg. So these are the values. So if, for example, they don't give us certain values, so they don't give us the distance over here on the map, okay, you can obviously see there that it's 54 kilometers. But let's say, for example, they didn't give it to us. But on this side, they gave you those two values. You can just minus these two values um, from each other, 402 minus 348, and that will give you the 54. So maybe the person blocks that out, the 54, and they ask you what is the distance between those two towns. You simply just minus the two values from each other. So you don't have to always go forward. Sometimes you can also work backwards as well. What is also very important to note, and actually something they asked a few years back, um, they asked about, I'm just going to use it in this context. As you can see here, that says 75 kilometers. This is 25 kilometers. And they asked, um, for example, you know, why is it, um, you know, a similar length, but the one value is bigger than the other value? Or, you know, that'll be different, obviously not. So let's have a look at this one rather. So this one is 24 kilometers over there. And then this one's also 24 kilometers over there. So as you can see, this is quite a small little piece for 24 kilometers, but this one is a much longer piece for 24 kilometers. So what's very important to note about a strip map is that it's not drawn to scale. Okay, so a couple of years back, the question asked, why is it that the distances were the same, but the, the length was a bit longer on the one? And it's specifically because it's not drawn to scale. And many of the learners couldn't answer that. So that to me says, that they didn't fully understand um, how a strip map works. So yes, these are not drawn um, to scale. It's it's purely just for planning purposes um, for your trip. Okay, so if we go um, back to the actual question. So the first um, question that's asked that's being asked, let me just zoom in again so we can all see the questions. So the first question that's being asked is to name the national roads that Ramon will use to travel um, to Port Elizabeth. So we're going from Colesburg to Port Elizabeth. So I hope you've got the strip map in front of you so that I don't have to keep going backwards and forward. But as you can see there, you're going to use the N10. And then as you're going along down towards Port Elizabeth, you're also going to use the N2 as well. So two marks for that question. So the first mark is going to be allocated um, for N10, and then the second mark is going to be allocated for the N2. This is also a paper one question paper. Okay, the next question that's being asked, it says, which national park is furthest from the N10? So furthest. So the first thing, it's also for two marks, 
is that you have to go and see where is the national parks. So if you have a look, and this is again, before you even look at questions, you must analyze what information you have been given. So if you have a look at the bottom, there's a key there for you. So you've got the fact that um, this is the national road, the R means regional road. And then just on the right hand side here, you can see NP means national park. So some of the learners might have picked up already because they might have been to, you know, the Kruger or to Addo, for example. Um, so they might know that Addo is a national park. So without even using the key, they would have realized that's a national park. But as you can see there from the key, national park has been given to you. So the first thing we need to do is we need to go and actually have a look what national parks is on this picture for us. And as you can see, there is the Mountain Zebra National Park, which remember it's specifically from the N10. So you've got your Mountain Zebra National Park and you've got your Addo National Park. So you've got those two parks, national parks. And if you have a look at the value, this one is 25 and this one is 24. So to answer the question, the question's asking which one is the furthest from the N10. So obviously then it'll be Mountain Zebra with the 25 kilometers. Right, so 4.1.2's answer will then be Mountain Zebra National Park. The next question, Ramon met a friend in Patterson who had to travel 61 kilometers via the R336 from his hometown and you need to name the friend's hometown. So again, we're doing quite a lot of work on this map and that's why I say it's so important to have a look at the map before you even attempt the question just so you know what you're dealing with. Okay, so I need to first allocate, um, allocate, sorry, I first need to go and find the R336. Okay, so I've gone and I found it over there. I need to locate it rather than a Y keep saying, saying allocate. So there's the R336, all right? And if you go back to the, the wording of the question, it says he met a friend in Patterson who had to travel 61 kilometers. So there's Patterson over there and it's via the R336. So, if I'm over here and I need to then go on the R336 towards Patterson, then I'm going to go there, there, and then there. Now I just add those values together and I hope and pray and hold my breath that I get 61 kilometers. So if I take that 29 plus the 8, so let's have a look here. So we're going to say 29 plus the 8 plus the 24. And when I do that, I get 61 kilometers. So that means that I am, um, my friend rather is coming from Kirkwood. Sorry, I just want to quickly read that call. All right. So it'll be the 29 plus the 8 plus the 24. So that gives you the 61. So that means that the friend stays in Kirkwood. So again, two marks, but there was a little bit of work that I had to put in. So yeah, this is now where the reading comes from. And also just making sure that you understand the map itself. So the reason why I need to have a look there was because the question said they're traveling um, to Patterson. So I went and I found Patterson. And I also saw that they are using the R336. So from there, I could kind of figure out what it was that the question was asking. All right. So the last question, 4.1.4. You have to calculate the, the, the travel distance between the two national parks. So in other words, if I started in Addo Elephant National Park and then I got back onto the N10 and then I went to Mountain Zebra National Park, then how many kilometers did I travel? So I've got those 24 kilometers that I traveled and then I need to see how many kilometers I traveled along the N10. So from there, to there going through Craddock and then from there then the 25 kilometers to get to Mountain Zebra National Park. So this is now where the three marks is coming from because I need to go work out what the distance is over here along the N10. So that's where my um, marks is coming from because there is a little bit of um, work that I need to go and put into there. So I need to add the 25 and the 24 together. That's all easy, but then it's just going and working out the distance between these two towns over here, Craddock and Patterson. So I'm just going to put it on the, the uh, show you the memo again, because I just want to put a little bit of emphasis on where the marks is coming from. Okay, so I'm here by 4.1.4. 4. 
So if you have a look there, there is different ways of doing it. Okay, so the 25 and the 24, like I said, that's quite easy to do. But where, where the problem is coming in here is that that distance that you have to go and subtract from one another to go and work it out. So the two different ways of doing it, I'm just going to go back to the map again, is if you have to go and use... Um, hi. Um, sorry, Alicia. Yes. Um, Mr. Bambisane asks if you could please um, slow down a bit. Okay, I'll try my best. Thank you. Okay. So if you're then going to go, remember what I said now, we're getting, we're leaving Addo Elephant um, National Park. So we're driving the 24 kilometers. We're then going along the N10. And then we're also going to take those 25 kilometers over there as well. So as I said before, this 24 and 25, those two values is quite easy. But now we need to go, we need to actually go and work out the distance traveled between Patterson and Craddock. So as I showed you on the memo, there's two different ways of doing it. So the first way that you could do it is you could work out the distances from this side. So the 207 minus the 22. And then the other option is to work on the left hand side and work out the distance over there between those two. So the 380 minus the 195. So as you can see, there's two different approaches that you can go and take. Right, so when we go and we minus those values from one another, you're going to get a total of 185 kilometers. And if you double check, if you do it on the side as well, you'll also get 185. So you can see it doesn't matter which approach that you go and take. Okay, so now we know that it's 185 kilometers from Patterson to Craddock. So like I said, you've got that 24 kilometers there, you've got the 185 kilometers there, and then the 25 kilometers there. So that's why it's three marks, because there's a little bit of work that you need to put in. So I'm gonna just put the memo back on so you can see where exactly the marks is being allocated. Okay, so as you can see, it's a level two question, which I'm sure many of you are wondering why level two and it feels so complicated. Okay, but it's really not so difficult as long as you understand how the strip map works. So like I said, the 25 and the 24 kilometers, we know where that value comes from there. But that 207 minus 22 obviously showed you now how to do it. So that's where the 185 is coming from. So that's why there's a mark specifically added for it. Okay, so it's your RT mark for your correct distances. So that's for getting the 207 minus the 22. Or if you wanted to use the other approach, the 380 uh, minus the 195. Okay, so that's where the 185 is coming from. So you're going to add your 24, your 25, and the 185, and then you're going to get a total of 234 kilometers. Okay, so again, you're going to have one mark for getting that 185, a method mark then for adding the three values together, and then a CA mark for your answer. So if you made a little bit of a mistake here, by the RT mark, you'll lose that RT mark, but then you can still get a CA mark provided that you've got that 25 and that 24 there. So you could still get two out of three, even if you make a mistake. So it's always good to attempt questions because as you can see, there's a lot of marks just for realizing that you needed to minus those two values from each other, you're getting a mark for that. So my advice is to, to always attempt a question and see what marks that you can still get, even if you're struggling with the question. Okay, I hope I'm slowing down enough. Um, Masi Bambisane says, can you repeat question 4.1.4? Okay, it's the one I'm busy with. All right, so I'll quickly just go through it again. Okay, so let's just go through what the question is asking us. Again, the question is asking us for the distance um, between the two national parks. Okay, calculate the travel distance between the two national parks. So in other words, if I get into my car from, doesn't matter which one, let's say Addo, so Addo Elephant National Park. If I get into my car and I drive from Addo National Park and I go towards Mountain Zebra National Park, 
how many kilometers am I going to travel? So remember, I'm going to get into my car. I need to drive those 24 kilometers to get onto the N10. So I'm driving towards Patterson. Okay. And then from there, I need to go through Somerset East. So we're nice in the Eastern Cape now. We're going to go through Somerset East. We're going to go towards Craddock. And then from there, we're going to drive these 25 kilometers to get to Mountain Zebra National Park. So I need to go and work out how far it is basically between Patterson and Craddock. So those two values over there. So as I said, there's two different ways that you can attempt this question. You can either then minus the 207 and the 22 together. So then you're going to get the 185 kilometers. Or on the other side, you can use the Colesburg to Port Elizabeth route. And you can say 380 minus 195. So either way, whichever way you're minusing these values together, you're still going to get the 185. So now I know how far it is between these two places, between Patterson and Craddock. So I'm going to drive the 24 kilometers plus the 185 kilometers plus the 25 kilometers, which means I got a total of 234 kilometers. Okay, so that is the total distance that I'm going to drive. So again, if I go um, back to the memo, I'll keep it on the strip map for now. But if you have a look at the memo, then you're getting a mark specifically for getting to that 185. That's why I say always attempt as much of the question that you can, because you're getting a mark just for working out at 185. And then you've got those three values. So you're getting an extra mark now just for adding the three values together. And then you're getting a CA mark for the answer of 234 kilometers. So I'm just going to put it back onto the memo again. So the memo, you've got to 25 kilometers plus the 185 that we've got and worked out, plus the 24 kilometers. And then it gives us a total of 234 kilometers in total. So that is the distance that you're going to travel if you are leaving the one national park, getting onto the N10, and then traveling to the next national park. So I hope that, excuse me, makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so that's one type of map that you can get, which is a strip map. Other maps that you can get as well, it will be your elevation map, um, a grid reference. So there's a lot of different types of, of maps and plans that you can get um, in, in your final question paper. So this is why doing past papers is so important, because then you get exposure to the different types of maps and plans that you can get. So another type of plan that we get will then be our floor plan, which you're going to have a look at now. And just um, other diagrams as well that you can get that I'm not going to go through. I'm just going to have a quick look. You can get something like this, which I don't really want to spend time on because you don't know what you're going to get. But this is what you call your assembly diagrams. So you can get instructions on how to do something. So again, it's just good to practice a lot of these, but you don't know what you're going to get. Um, I know many years ago they gave a picture on how to remove a cell phone battery. And I remember many people thought it was quite a silly question, but it was nice marks to get. So make sure that you expose yourselves to various types of maps and plans. Another one that you can get, it didn't copy so nicely here, um, but on your document it should be a bit better. Um, you can get something like this, a seating plan. So it's just, it's very, very important to expose yourselves to as many question papers as possible so that you can see the different types of maps and plans that they give you. Okay, so these are type of questions where they can ask you the amount of seats, um, they can ask you directions, they can ask you where's the stage, they can ask you where is um, the lighting box, they can ask you if you're sitting in a particular seat, which entrance can you take? So there's a whole bunch of different questions I know they asked a similar type of question in last year's paper too. So it does creep in every now and again. So this is, again, why I said it's so important to expose yourself um, to past papers. Okay, so that's just another one that you can get. So let's just have a look um, at the floor plan next. 
Okay, so this is a paper one question. I'll just zoom it in a little bit. Again, please stop if there's any questions. Okay, so this is a floor plan of a house in Port Elizabeth. Okay, you don't, again, you don't know which um, type of question you're going to get, um, what type of a floor plan you're going to get. So again, have a look at past papers. Uh, you can go on to Property 24, for example, and have a look at like new um, establishments, new estates, because they normally have floor plans. So have a look at these things, look how they work. It's just so good to um, constantly expose yourselves to types of questions that you can be asked. So this question over here is a floor plan of a house. It's got measurements. And what's very, very important here again is um, the fact where north is. So we always assume that north is going to be facing upwards like it is in this question. It doesn't always. Sometimes it goes down. So just be mindful of that. But that is something that you need to make sure that is on the question paper is that they indicate the direction. Okay. Um, let's have a look at what the question is asking us as well. So they're telling us that um, all measurements are in millimeters. Okay, over there, all measurements are in millimeters. So that's something else that we need, need to just take into account. So all these measurements that were given on this floor plan are all in millimeters. So I do know then that some conversions is probably um, going to have to take place here. Okay, so if we have a look at what the actual question is asking us, I just want to get to this as well. The memo, just so I have it on standby. So the first question is asking us to give in millimeters the external length of the wall that makes the area of bedroom one larger than bedroom two. So this is a heck of a lot of reading just for a two mark question. So all they're asking us is they're telling us that bedroom one is bigger than bedroom two. And we need to write down the length that makes it bigger than that. So all we need to do here, if you have a look at the floor plan, you can see they both have the same width of 3,550. So that one there and that one there. But as you can see that the length of bedroom one is 3,750, where the length of bedroom two is 3,550. So the answer for the first question is simply just 3,750 millimeters. So again, it's quite a, a funny way of wording the question, but that is in essence what they were actually just asking for. I mean, an easier way to have put it would have just been to say, write down the length of, or the external length of bedroom one. That would have been a lot easier to, to ask, but they obviously made it a little bit more complicated, but that is just what they were basically asking you. The second question, 4.2.2, determine in meters, okay? So meters, and I told you this is gonna come up somewhere along the line to convert. So you need to determine in meters, the total external length of the Western wall of the house. Okay, so Western, okay? So this is now why I made mention of the fact that you need to go and check where is North. Okay, so if we go back to our plan, again, just a two mark question. Okay, so obviously we know where north is. So north, and then if you had to go and draw the rest of your compass, you're gonna have south and west. So now we know where west is, and it says we need to determine in meters the total external length of the western wall of the house. So this is the western wall over here. Okay, so now we just need to write down how long it is basically, but then they also want it in meters. Okay, so we need to first go and work out how much all these values are together. So when you add all these values together, so basically it's the 3550 and the 3750 because these two is identical. So when you add the values um, together, you get 7,300 millimeters. So all I've done there is I've just simply added the three values together of the Western wall. So I've added the 2050, the 1700, and the 3550. So now I know how long this wall is, the Western wall, 
but then the question also specifically asked um, for us to write it then in meters. So now I just need to still go and convert to meters. So how I go and I convert to meters is, remember, we need to divide by a thousand. So why am I dividing by a thousand? Well, I'm going to divide by 10 and then I'm going to divide by a hundred or you could just go one shot and divide by a thousand. So I'm dividing by 10 first. And the reason why I'm dividing by 10 first is because there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. So if I had to get to centimeters, I would just divide by 10. And then remember that there are 100 centimeters in a meter, not a thousand. Be very careful about the learners always mess that up, okay? Centimeter, so like century or cents, is always a hundred, hundred percent, hundred cents in a rand, for example. So I'm dividing by 10 and then I'm dividing by a hundred or you can go one shot and just divide by a thousand. So when you do that, you get a total of 7,3 meters. Okay, so easy to mark question, but again, two marks because you're working for your marks. So the first mark is then allocated for actually getting the fact that it is 7,300, and then the second mark then is for going and converting it then into meters. And unfortunately, with conversions, you don't get CA marks. So with conversions, you either have to convert it correct or you don't get that mark. If you divided it by 10 by mistake, for example, we're not going to give you a CA mark, unfortunately. Conversions is right or wrong. So that is 4.5. 2.2. Okay, so 4.2.3. I'm just going to leave the floor plan um, on the screen so that you can just have a look at it while I'm reading the question. So 4.2.3 says that you need to name the room or rooms that has more than one entrance. So now you need to look for a room that has more than one entrance. So as you can see over here, it is the living room. There's an entrance there. There's an entrance there. So you've got two entrances to the living room. So the answer is living room. So that is 4.2.3's answer. I'll put the memo on as soon as I'm done with 4.2.4 and 4.2.5. 4.2.4, identify the room that has the same floor area as the living room. So I think what some of the learners might have gone and did was actually go and work out the areas first. But that's not necessary because, first of all, it's only two marks. So it wouldn't have been that excessive for two marks. So if you have a look at the floor plan again, you'll see that living room two and bedroom two are identical when it comes to the length. They both have 3,550 for the length. And if you go back to the top here, you've got 3,550 for the width. So if you actually have to go and write this down, you'll see that this is also 3550, and then this will also be 3550. So both the living room and the bedroom two are 3550 by 3550. So length times by width, and on this side as well, 3550 by 3550. So both of these floor areas are going to be the same. So like I said, I think some learners would have gone and worked out the area. It's not necessary. It's just making that conclusion or realizing that they both have the same length and they both have the same width as each other. So therefore their floor um, area should then be the same. And in the last question, and then I'll put the memo on just for you to see, 4.2.5, it's saying which um, bathroom fixture, fixture is not shown on the floor plan. So as you can see here, you've got a toilet and you've got a bath. So now the learner had to go and think a little bit and ask themselves what else would be in a bathroom then. And that would be a, the obvious answer would be a basin, okay, a sink or a wash basin. But according to the memo, they also accepted cupboard. So I'm gonna just put the memo on for everyone just to have a look at. And again, just to see how the marks have been allocated. Okay, so 4.2.1 was just two marks for the answer. 4.2.2 I explained already. There was a one mark for actually going and working it out and one mark for converting. 4.2.3 is right or wrong. But I see here they've also awarded, so as you can see on the right-hand side, by the explanations, 
where we said the one that has the two entrances, we said the answer was living room. Some of the learners went and wrote the passage and some learners went and wrote the kitchen. So as you can see, only one mark was awarded to those learners for choosing passage or kitchen. So normally what happens here is that a lot of the learners go and they write these things and then it's discussed and then marks are then allocated for this. So living room was obviously the ideal answer, but there was obviously then a fight for perhaps giving the learners at least some marks here. So they obviously then went and decided on one mark. And again, this is why working through the memo is such a good thing because you can see how um, the, the people who set up the test, you know, how the examiner, how they feel um, about the question paper. 4.2.4, identify the room that has the same floor area as the living room is bedroom two. And then 4.2.5, which bathroom fixture is not shown on the floor plan. Okay, so a wash basin, a sink, or a water basin. Some of the learners said shower. Okay, because if you go back to the floor plan, you'll see there's a bath. So some learners said that a shower is missing. And then as you can see, they also accepted cupboard as an option. So some learners obviously thought that there needs to be a cupboard in the bathroom as well. So obviously, like I said, the wash basin for me is the most obvious choice. But then as um, they were marking the papers, they saw that there was other alternatives as well. So shower or cupboard. And all of these questions, so for 4.2, um, question 4.2, all of these 10 marks were level one questions. So in essence, if I can say this, is that all learners should be getting those 10 marks, uh, should be getting 10 out of 10 for this question. So these should be marks that I can say you, you put in your pocket. The, some of the marks that learners uh, bank on to get correct. Okay, so that is the floor plan. Is there anyone who would like me just to go through something on the floor plan again, or can I move on to the next um, question, which is another map? Um, they're asking if you could please repeat question 4.2.2. Okay, great. Good question. Okay, 4.2.2. Sorry, I'm not reading the chats. 4.2.2 um, is, yeah, this one over here. Okay, so let's just have a look at the wording of the question again. So 4.2.2 says, I'm just going to put the question on so you can all see it. Okay, so like I said, it's a two mark question. Um, but for me, there was quite a bit of work that we had to put in here for this question. So the first part of the question that we need to take note of is the fact that it is in meters. Okay, so we have to determine in meters the total external length of the western wall. So the second part that we needed to put focus on is the fact that it's the western wall. So determining it in meters and then also the fact that it's the western wall. So we just need the length, okay? So if you go back to the floor plan, as I said, there you've got your compass direction, so north, east, south, and west. So the western wall will obviously be that way to the west, which means it's this wall over here. And they said western wall, so that means the whole thing. They didn't say um, the west side of the living room or the west wall in the kitchen. They spoke about the western wall, which means it's the whole house. Okay, so this is the western wall of the house, all right? Okay, so we've got those values over there, okay, all three, okay, western wall of the house. So we've got the western wall of the kitchen, of the bathroom, and of the living room. So the first thing we needed to do was we actually needed to go and add the values together to get the total length of the western wall. So that's where the 7,300 millimeters is coming from. It's by adding those three values together. But then if you go back to the question, the question is specifically asking us for meters, okay, meters. So we needed to go and convert um, from millimeters to meters. So if you have a look, I can actually just quickly turn this over. And if you go from millimeters to centimeters to meters, okay, so from your millimeters to your centimeters. So remember, we're now going from millimeters to meters. So if you go from millimeters to centimeters, you are going to divide by 10 because there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. If you go from centimeters to meters, then you need to divide 
by 100 because there is 100 centimeters in a meter. So that's what I also said just now, is that a lot of learners, they go and they divide by 1,000 here. But remember, there's 100 centimeters um, in a meter. So like I said, think of percentage, okay, out of 100, 100 cents in a rand, so it's 100. So when you go from centimeters, okay, to meters, it's divided by 100. But because you're going from millimeters to meters, okay, we're going to do a double jump here, and we are going to go straight, and we are going to divide by 1,000. So you can either divide by 10 and then divide by 100, or you can go and do the big jump and divide by 1,000. Okay, and it's very good to study um, these measurements as well because these are not given to you in a test or an exam. This is the metric system. So you are expected to know how the metric system works. It's only when you go to, um, imperial system, so like miles or pounds, for example, those conversions is given to you in a test. But in um, the metric system, we are expecting the learners to know how this works. So we're going to divide by 1,000. Okay, so if we go back. So that's where I've got the divide 10 and the divide 100 from. Okay, it's that double jump, or you can go and divide by 1,000 first step, and then you get a mark for converting. So I'm just going to go back to the memo as well to show you once again um, the descriptors, because that for me, again, is so vital to understand how the marker is thinking when they mark your, your question paper at the end of the year. Okay. So if we have a look at the actual memo, we are going to add the values together. And then we are going to say 7.3 meters. So when you add the values together, you're going to get the 7,300 and then you get the 7.3 meters. Another option to do it is this way of doing it on the memo is that they've gone and converted each individual amount um, to meters so long and then they get 7.3 meters. So if I go back to the floor plan again, they took that one, divided it by 1,000, that one and divided it by 1,000, and then that one and divided it by 1,000 to get all three of them into meters, and then they only went and added the three values together. So that is another way of doing it as well. So please, I always tell my learners this as well. It's so important to make sure that when you are setting up your answers in a test or an exam, that you show all your steps for the marker. And this is, again, why I find, um, yes, go through the question papers, uh, write down the answers, and then use the memo to mark it. But don't just mark something right or wrong. So if you see your answer doesn't match the memo, you can't just mark it wrong and move on. You need to go and read the explanation. You need to go read the descriptors and see where the marks are being allocated. And also, you're welcome to ask your educator to help you mark your question papers just to see. Because now maybe you give yourself zero for the question, but then your educator actually shows you can still get one or two for the question paper. And in doing this, in, in working through the descriptors, then you are learning how to follow the steps and you're learning how to think like a marker almost. Remember, the marker doesn't know who you are. You are a number on a piece of paper for them. So you need to show your, your steps. You need to show your calculations, and you need to write it out neatly. Um, you know, if I mark my learner's papers, I can kind of figure it out. I know the learner's handwriting, and then I'll say, oh, I realize now how this child is thinking, and I can maybe then, you know, try and award a mark because I'm understanding more or less where they're coming from. But at the end of the year, that marker is not understanding where you're coming from. They are simply just looking at a memo and putting a tick where the memo is telling you to put a tick. So please make sure that you set your questions out neatly, that you write neatly, that you're showing the marker what you do. If you are working out the area of living room one, or, or, or rather living room or bedroom one, then write down bedroom one dot dot and show them that you're working out that area because that will make it a lot easier for them to mark. They'll feel a lot less frustrated as well when they are marking your question paper because it becomes quite difficult when you don't understand what the learner is trying to tell you. Okay, so anything else there on the floor plan? Or can I go to the next um, map with the directions? Okay, so I'm assuming no more questions. So I'm going to move on. 
Okay, so the next one is also a map, which didn't um, copy so nicely when I printed it. So I'm just going to um, rather put it on the screen so that you can see it nicely. Okay, so there is the, the map. And just take note of the scale there because you'll see on my printed one, unfortunately, that the scale did not um, print. So I'm going to put it onto the visualizer, but as I said, it came out slightly differently on mine, but this is just the map that we are working with. Um, again, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because we have looked at a map already, but it's just that scale that I wanted to just focus on a little bit. All right, so if you have a look at the map, like I said, it didn't copy quite the same when I printed it. But remember, all that's missing now is just that scale that was there at the bottom. Okay, so again, for some of you, this map might be something that you've seen before. I'm sure many of you have taken a few trips um, with your parents, so you recognize some of these names of the towns. Um, so I always like it when we do questions like these and we can actually talk about some of these places as well. So the first question, I'm just going to read it and you can have a look at the map. The first question is asking us to identify the road that must be traveled on between Tilbach and Siri. So again, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because we have already looked at a similar map, but just um, one or two things I would like to put a little bit of emphasis on. So from Tilbach to Ceres, over there, um, you can see there is the R46. So that's just two marks, a level one question for being able to tell the marker that you are traveling on um, R46. The next one, 4.1.2, is asking us um, for the name or name the type of the scale that's shown on the map. Okay, so that was, um, if I go back to the Word document, over there, as you can see, I'm sorry, now it's the wrong way around, but there it says one is to two, seven, four, two, eight, five, seven. So that is what we call our number scale, okay, or our numeric scale or our ratio. So sometimes they do ask you these type of questions. This is from last year's paper one. So they ask the learners to write down the name of the scale. And again, this is something that you don't always, um, you know, put emphasis on to study. You know, you, you think you just know it. Um, and then when they go and ask you the question, you've got no idea what they're talking about. So you, you know what it is, but you don't know really what it's called. So it'll be your ratio scale or your number scale or your numeric scales, also an option that you could have um, written as well. Okay, so again, it's little things that you should just make sure that you are aware of. Yes, we give you a lot of information, but it's also important to know what it is um, that we are giving you. Okay. And then um, the next question, also something I want to put a little bit of emphasis on, is to write down the general direction from Neisner to Mossel Bay. So just a tip on how to do this question, because I find that the learners struggle with general direction. So general direction always means um, your north, your northeast, or your south, or whatever the case is. Because as sometimes the learners, they'll write down, if, for example, it's a floor plan, and we ask you the general direction from the fridge to the couch, then the learners will say it's by the door, for example. But that's not the general direction. That is in um, proportion or in, in um, relation to another object. So just be careful of that wording. So general direction, we are speaking about north, south, southeast, or whatever the case is. And then also what's important is that north or south always comes first. You can't say um, east, south, for example. You have to say southeast. So north and south always come first. And no, you cannot say north, south. Okay, that's completely different directions. So just um, have a bit of a, a you know sit down session and make sure that you understand the the general direction. Okay, so um, if you have a look at this map there, there is north. Okay, because it also wasn't printed on on mine. So north is now obviously pointing up. The nice cliched way of showing north, but remember we can also point it downwards as well. So please. Um, don't always just assume that north is up. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read the question again. General direction from Neisner to Mossel Bay. So how I teach this section to my learners is, obviously now we had north facing up. 
So what I tell my learners to do is to go and draw the compass directions on the map. So like over the map. Remember, this is your question paper. You can do whatever you want with it. So I tell them to go and draw on the maps. So I've got north, east, south, west. Okay, never eat sour worms or naughty elephant spray water, however it is you want to use to remember it. Okay, we always use the never eat sour worms because that's a rule in our house at the moment. Okay, so um, never eat south worms, okay, north, east, south, west. And then you need to write down the general direction from Neisner to Mossel Bay. So we need to first go and find Neisner and Mossel Bay, okay. And then don't forget about the ones in between as well. Okay, so we've got our northeast, northeast. Okay, where am I getting northeast from? Okay, northeast. Okay, not east, north, northeast. North is always first. Um, I'm going to just draw this side. And we only expect you to know the eight. Okay, you don't have to know the in betweeners as well. Those of you that maybe take geography and then you, you know of north, northeast, and south, southwest. Don't worry about those ones. You just expect it to know these ones. So then it's southeast and southwest. And this one over here will be northwest. Okay, so it's important for you to draw that. And you'll see now why I'm drawing it over the map. Okay, so now I'll go read the question again. The question is saying, write down the general direction from Neisner to Muscle Bay. Okay, so from Neisner to Mossel Bay. So now what you're going to do is you're going to take your ruler and you're going to draw your line with your ruler. And I'm going to put an arrow there as well so that you can see. All right, so now that you've drawn it like that, now you've got to go and you've got to look which one it looks the most similar to. So if almost like parallel, but as you can see, like this one's not going completely parallel. But if you have a look at this one over here, I'm just going to put a highlighter through it this direction here and my arrow is obviously not going this way this one is pretty similar to this one as you can see it's running parallel with this one so if I start my ruler there again okay the arrow is going down you can see that it's following a similar direction slightly off okay but that's why it's got the word general direction okay so therefore this one is going to be south west okay you can't say south unfortunately it's not going down you can't say west all right because west would mean like a straight line running across to the left but it's not okay so if you had to go and draw your south over here for example and your west you can see it's not going straight to the left it's not going straight down it's slightly in between so when you draw this you can see it's sort of matching with southwest so that's why the general direction is going to be southwest. And then also where the learners um, um, struggle with this as well is that from and to. Okay, so it was from Neisner to Muscle Bay. So that's why I drew the arrow going towards Muscle Bay. So it's just that reading aspect again. Okay, so please make sure that you read what the question is saying. The question read, write down the general direction from Neisner to Muscle Bay. Okay, um, I hope everyone understands that, but that's how I usually um, explain the, the section of work to my learners. All right, so if we go back um, to the question, I hope I can go back now. Okay, so we said Southwest for 4.1.3. Okay, so if um, before I go to 4.1.4, if I just have a look at the memo, you can say um, SW, you can write southwest, um, you can say west of southwest, for example. Okay, I think that's more for the, the geography learners that really want to get technical. Okay, but like I said, stick to those basic, basic eight. Okay, 4.1.4. The total distance from Cape Town to Worcester via Tilbach is 210 kilometers. Table four indicates the actual distances between some of the towns on Cape Route 62, and then you just have to determine the missing value A. So if from Cape Town to Worcester is 210, that means that all these values 
um, together have to add up to 210, which you can see just by quick calculation that they don't. So if you add them all together, you need to get to 210. So if you add the 62 with the 13 with the 82, then you're only getting a total of 157 kilometers. So that missing value A will then be the 210 minus the 157 kilometers. And when you do that, you get 53 kilometers. So this is also just a simple level one question. So all the questions we've looked at so far are level one questions. And again, this is why the descriptors are so important because then you're getting exposure to what a level one question looks like, what a level three question look like, looks like. So maybe for you, the previous question, the one of the general direction, maybe for you, it was actually quite a difficult question. But then when you go and look at the descriptors, you'll see that it's actually just a level one question. So maybe for you, it just means you need to put a little bit more focus on how to do it. Maybe for you, it feels like a level four question, but it's actually just level one. So it's very, very important to see the level so you can know which levels maybe you need a little bit more practice on, for example. Okay. And then the last question of this question, um, 4.1, Pete wants to visit his cousin who lives along the Cape Route 62. He uses the following directions um, to his cousin's house. Okay, he takes the R60 from Worcester to Montague. From Montague, he proceeds to Barrydale. And then from Barrydale, he takes the R62 to the next town where his cousin lives. Study the directions and then write down the name of the town where his cousin lives. So again, two marks, and all you have to do is write down the town. But the reason why it's two marks is because there is a little bit of effort that you need to put in. This is now a level two question. Okay, because it's not as obvious as just identifying the town. You, you had to actually just go and um, look what it is that the question was saying. So if they ask you just to identify something where there isn't really much of an effort of just looking, then that'll be level one. But because now there's a little bit of work that's taking place, we're now going to go a little bit up now and look at a level two question. So now we need to just follow the instructions. So we need to go back to the map and... The first instruction says that we need to take the R60 um, from Worcester to Montague. So we need to first go and find Worcester to Montague, which is over there. Okay, so I've at least got that. So now I'm on the first part and I'm seeing R60, I'm seeing Worcester and I'm seeing Montague. So now I'm already thinking, great, I'm getting somewhere. Then he goes to Barrydale. So now I'm over there. Okay, so I've traveled there, I've traveled there and I've traveled there. So I've got Worcester, I've got the R60, I've got Montague, and I've got Barrydale. So I'm already following the instructions quite nicely. And then from Barrydale, I'm reading the instructions. He takes the R62 to the next town. So there's the R62. So therefore, what is the next town? It'll then be Lady Smith. Okay, so the answer for 4.1.5 is Lady Smith. And all I did was I followed just a few instructions sometimes. Um, learners, they just go to the last line and they just read the last line. So they say, oh, from Barrydale, he takes the R62. So there's Barrydale, there's R62, so there's Lady Smith. Okay, you can approach it like that, but just be a little bit um, more cautious if you're going to go that route of just starting with the, the bottom one. So 4.1.5's answer is Lady Smith. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly put the, the memo on just to quickly show you how um, the marks were allocated again and specifically just looking at the descriptors and the levels. Okay, so the first answer was just two marks for writing the R46. 4.1.2 was also just two marks for writing down number scale or numeric scale or ratio scale. A lot of the learners probably would have said a ratio scale um, or number scale. The next one is Southwest or SW or West of Southwest. Okay, and like I said, that's going more for your geography kids. And then 4.1.4, you just had to minus, so a method accuracy for subtracting correct values. So in other words, you had to get this correct to get that first mark. And then from there, a CA mark for the next one. And then the last one uh, for Lady Smith, two marks. So that's right or wrong. There's no CA marks there. So as I said, you can see they're all level one questions. Um, and then the last one's a level two. That MP there is just standing for 
um, maps and plans. So obviously then when they set out the grid analysis, they can say how many marks was allocated to data, how many marks was allocated to finance, how many marks was allocate, allocated to maps and plans, for example. So that's where the MP is coming from. Okay, and then just the last little question squished in here as well. And then I just want to put emphasis on because it's a level four question, even though for some of you it might seem quite obvious. Okay, so this question over here, um, the layout plan of the copy room at Academy School is given below. Justify with a reason whether or not the copier is suitably, suitably placed in the room. So this again, why I wanted to just quickly go through this question is because it is a level four question. And again, for some of you, it seems quite easy. Um, but where it's coming from is the fact um, the word justify. Justify is causing it to be a level four question because you're giving your opinion. The moment you're giving your opinion, you're going to a level four question. So if you need to justify this, whether or not it's correctly placed in a suitable place in the room, case suitable. Okay, so suitable can go one of two ways. You could either feel that it is suitable or you could feel that it's not suitable. So if you have a look at the memo quickly, there's one mark for the justification and one mark for the reason. And again, make sure that you answer the question. So you can't just you can't just say um, in the test exam um, it's in the wrong place, for example. You need to just you need to go through it a little bit in a little bit more detail, but you don't need a five page essay on how dangerous it is. So first things first, you need to decide do you think it's suitably to be placed or don't you think? So it is or it isn't. Okay, that's very important. You need to just state your, you know, your comment. And then from there, you can just explain. So no, you do not need a five page essay, but you also need to make sure that you decided. Because if you just write, um, for example, um, the copier was placed um, in, a, in a way that it was accessed for, for everyone. Does that mean now that you're agreeing that it's suitably placed or does it mean you don't think it was suitably placed? So obviously it sounds like you're meaning it's suitably placed but you haven't stated that it was suitable. So you need to just make sure that you're answering what it is that the question is asking for you. And I've said that quite a few times. Okay, so again, you can go one of two ways. Yeah, there was no right or wrong answer, if I could say it like that. So the obvious um, answer here, or the, the choice that you could make, is that you could say that it's not suitable. And for obvious reasons is that the electrical lead, you know, is in the way, okay? It's dangerous. Someone can stand on it. Someone can pull the plug out. Um, someone can get seriously injured. Okay, you don't need to be dramatic and say someone might die, for example. But um, you know, just have a little bit more meat, meat on the bones. Just make sure that you explain that if someone could get injured or um, they could trip over the the cord or they could pull it out of the socket the whole time, which might damage the machine, for example. So that's that's the one way of looking at it. Another way that you could look at it is the fact that it's in the middle. So you're wasting space, okay? Um, so maybe you'd prefer if it was closer to the lead for or the plug rather, okay? So it was more on that side. And then some learners might have taken um, another option and say that it was suitable to be placed because now you could sort of walk in and go around from all sides and use the copier. So there was different ways, different approaches that you could take when answering this question. But like I said, it's just so important that you make sure that you're actually answering the question. There are specifics that they're looking for. And again, I'm going to say it again, this is why going through the descriptors is so important because then you actually learn how to answer the questions in a way that the marker is looking for. So those are your different options. It's crossing the floor, so it could be dangerous. A person can fall over. It's in the middle of the room, so it's taking up space. Um, it's not suitably placed because it's facing the window. It can attract criminals. So a criminal might come in and you know try and steal massive photocopier out of the window okay <laughs> and then um the copier is suitably placed since it can now be accessed from all sides so you see there's different approaches that learners took with this question and now again you might have written something slightly different but then what the market does is they look and see what direction that you're going in okay so um they will see what you wrote and how much alike it is to one of these points that's on the memo and then they'll they'll use their discretion to see if it is what you were trying to say when they give you the marks for this question. So yeah, that was just something I felt I needed to just share with everyone. Okay. 
Is there anything that I need to explain with that? So a minute or two to catch our breath. All right, so I'm assuming everyone is fine. Um, I don't want to go through this question as well because we're just running out of time. Um, I just would like to start with um, the next part as well, otherwise we're not going to get to it. So again, I'm just going to quickly show you this. Um, there is a map and scale question on this as well. We have covered it briefly. Um, so just going to have a quick look at this as well. Okay, so what I just want to quickly show you with this, this is from a paper two in 2017. Okay, so just something um, to take note of is the different um, scale that they've used here. Okay, this is your line scale. So with this one, you will go and measure to work out the scale. And then they're asking us to actually go and work out the actual dimensions in meters with 3.1.2. Okay, which we will, I think, touch on in a later question as well. But what I wanted to just remind you of is that there is a different form of scale. All right. That is just something that's important. So please also make sure that you have a ruler for your exam. Very, very important. You don't want to throw away marks. Um, and also a ruler that works, please. Um, you see learners with rulers and the numbering is so faded. You need to make sure that you have um, a ruler that actually has the numbering properly you know, printed on it so that you don't throw away a mark because you guessed um, that the distance is two, two centimeters when actually it was 2.4 for argument's sake. You're throwing away such silly marks. So please make sure that you have a ruler for your, your test or an exam. Okay, so I don't want to go through this one, mostly because I just want to get to the next section as well. Okay, so that's just another type of map that you can get. Okay, here's another map as well that I'm not going to go through. But like I said, this is why, this is a paper two from um, 2019, um, November. Okay, so just like I said, make sure that you go go through as many question papers as you can in order to, to make sure that you've got exposure. A question that I would like to just focus on for this particular question is number 1.1.4. So I hope you all have um, this question with you. If you don't, then you can obviously just read along with me. And the reason why I want to just go through this particular part is because of the speed, distance, and time, which I know learners do struggle with. So I would like to just have a focus with this one. So the question is asking us to verify with calculations whether his timing is correct. So again, because of that word verify, we're jumping here to a nice level four question. This is just a nice way to get those level four questions snuck in without making it too complicated. Okay, so this is a whole situation about um, uh, like agricultural show that's held at a, a park, Nampo Park in the Free State. Okay, so like I said, I don't think any of the questions really um, assist us with 1.1.4, but there was just one or two things here that I wanted to speak about. So if you have a look here, he's, he's departing from Nampo Park at 18.45 and he's traveling to Sasselberg at an average speed of 88 kilometers per hour. He calls his wife to inform her that he will arrive in Sasselberg at 8 p.m. And then you need to verify with calculations if his timing is going to be correct. In other words, is he going to be in trouble when he gets home or not? Okay, so first thing that you need to realize here, again, Something that I say often is that speed, distance, and time, um, you know, we teach to our grade eights, grade nines, um, and they do have a bit of knowledge from grade seven about this. So we all know how to do speed, distance, and time. But then what the wonderful examiners do is exactly what they've done in this question. They've asked you for the time, but they've given you the formula with distance as the subject of the formula. And now the learners start panicking and they go and they try and plug it into the formula as is and try and swap things around and then they get upset because we haven't done x's and y's since grade nine so what's going on but in actual fact we've done this in grade seven already so there's no reason why we should be panicking with this question so if distance is equal to speed multiplied by time it means that then that time is going to be equal to distance divided by speed i mean i expect my learners to know that 
Um, I'm sure many of your educators have taught you the, the triangle, the DST triangle, and I'm sure you've probably done it in natural science, and I understand it's many moons ago, but these are little things that you just have to keep packing on um, towards your final exam as well. So remember, this is giving us in terms of distance, but the question is actually asking us for timing, which means that we need to look for the time. So in other words, if we cover time, it's therefore distance divided by speed. So there's quite a few things happening here. This is quite a um, in detailed question. Okay, lots of little things we need to take into consideration. And then they were quite rude and they gave us the subject of the formula as distance. So they were a little bit mean as well there. But like I said, this is something we do in grade seven already. So there really isn't any reason why you can't conquer a question like this. So if you're going to work out time, you need to cover time. So therefore, it is distance divided by speed. So first thing that we need to look at is do we have the distance? OK, and we should have the distance because, like I said, we're not doing this whole question. But if you have a look at the map itself, we're going from Napo Park to Sasselberg. So again, if I just quickly summarize this map over here, that distance of 150 is the distance, if you have a look there, in kilometers to Nampo Park. So that 150 is already the distance. So that's something that you would have looked at when you had a look at this map in detail, which I'm sorry now that we couldn't really get to. Um, so we do have the distance. Okay, The distance is the 150. We do have the speed. Okay, the speed was given to us in the test. It is 88 kilometers per hour. What we don't have is the time. So we need to go and work out the time and then from there compare it to what Alfred told his wife. Okay, so we've got the distance of 150. I hope you understand where the 150 comes from. But like I said, if you go have a look at this question on your own later, you'll see where the 150 is coming from. It's just the distance from Sasselberg to Nampo Park. All right, so I'm just going to put the memo on so you can see where the thought process is here. Okay, so why I wanted to do this question with you is to show you over here is that they gave you the formula like this. Distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. But remember, we are changing the subject of the formula. So we want time is equal to distance divided by speed. So some learners do it like this, the, the, the very first um, mark, the SF, the substitution mark, this one over here. Some learners do it like that. They write it in as is from the formula, but then they get confused on how to actually change the formula around. That's why I said rather go back to what you've learned in the past and first change the subject of the formula before you go and substitute in. OK, so I would have first gone and said that time is equal to the distance divided by the speed. I would have immediately changed the formula and then from there substituted in. So one mark for substituting and then one mark specifically for changing the subject of the formula. Okay, so one mark for doing something that you've been trained to do from grade seven. So the 150 divided by the 88 gives you 1,7045 dot, dot, dot. And then you need to go and convert it into hours and minutes. Remember, this previous line is in hours, okay? Because time will be in hours if the distance is in kilometers and the speed is in kilometers per hour. That means your time is in hours. But we need to convert it to minutes and hours because remember, he left at 18.45. So we need to work out according to the real calculation what time he's getting home. So the reason why I wanted to also just focus on this question is because of that conversion process because the learners still struggle with doing this as well. So what some of the learners are saying is one hour, so 1, 70, I'm just going to quickly zoom in here. Okay, so the 1, 7, 7, 0, 4, 5. So then they say, okay, cool, it's one hour and 70 minutes because you just drop that one and you say it's 70 minutes. So then because it's one hour, and 70 minutes, this is completely wrong, so please don't listen actually. So one hour and 70 minutes, but now because that's 70 minutes, we actually need to make that an extra hour. So therefore it's two hours and 10 minutes. That's what some of the learners are still doing, okay? And it's complete nonsense, so please don't do it like this. So how do we actually go and convert that extra decimal to hours is that little comma seven part there. There's two different ways that you can do it. So the first way is you can just times that little part by 60. 
Now, why my time is in by 60 is because there are 60 minutes in an hour and we're converting from hours to minutes. So you can times that little extra part by 60 because remember, it's not a full hour. It's 70% of an hour. So 70% of an hour. So we need to multiply it by 60. The second way you can do it is you can use the time button on your calculator. If your educator has taught you how to use this, then it's great. If not, then I'm going to quickly show you how to do it now. So there is my calculator. So this is obviously if you've got the Casio. Some other um, scientific calculators also do it as well. The Sharps also do it. Okay, so what you can do is um, it's 150 and 88. So what you do is you take your calculator and you would work it out as you've done before. So the 150 divided by the 88. And then you'd say equals and you see there's your 1 comma 7 that I'm that you're seeing on the memo. And then all you do is you're going to push this button over here. Okay, that is your time button. And then as you can see, it's converting it for you. So the one hour, 42 minutes, and then 16 seconds and 36 split seconds as well. This is now where we're getting the one hour, 42 minutes from. So that is an, another alternative to working it out by using that time button. If you don't have the time button on your calculator, you've got like a basic um, four function calculator or you've got a scientific calculator but doesn't have this function, then all you're going to do is you're still going to do this. So the one comma 70. And then I'm just going to ditch that one because that one hour is full. So it's comma 704545 hours multiplied by 60. So I'm just converting it by multiplying it by 60. So 42 comma 27 minutes. So that's where the 42 minutes is coming from. So please, if you had to get something, this one's comma seven, so that helps a little bit. But sometimes if you get like one comma four five, for example, the learners will say one hour, 45 minutes. It's completely wrong. So please make sure that you know how to do this because you're throwing away that conversion mark. So yes, you're going to lose one mark in the whole process, but you're losing one mark for something that you could have actually gotten correct if you just understood the concept of that is in hours. So we need to times it by 60 to get it into minutes. So the reason why we're doing this, why we're timesing by 60 to get into hours and minutes is because now we need to check what time is actually getting home. So from quarter to seven plus one hour will then be quarter to eight plus another 42 minutes added on will then be 27 minutes past eight o'clock, which means that he was not correct. So Alfred said he was getting home a little bit earlier. He said he was getting home at eight o'clock. If I remember the question correctly, yes, eight o'clock. And according to our calculation, he is actually getting home at 27 minutes past eight. So Alfred was not correct. So he's going to be in a lot of trouble when he gets, gets home. So that's, again, with that other mark that you need to remember is that verification or justification, depending on how the question was worded. So again, the learners, they write 2027. 20, or even if they did it wrong and they got nine o'clock for argument's sake, you'll still get a CA mark there. But then they go and they forget to write that he was not correct. So they lose that mark. So remember, it's one mark that you're losing. But if you're losing one mark here and there, it adds up. And suddenly you've lost 2% for a paper. So please just make sure that you are actually answering what the question is asking. Is there anyone that wants me just to go through um, the speed, distance, and time concept again? Or can I quickly move on? Okay, then the next part that I want to get to is the measurement part. So unfortunately, I'm only really starting this section now. So please, I'd like to encourage all of you to carry on with these notes if you've got them. If you've got them electronically, please go through them. If you've got them as a hard copy, then please carry on working through it. And I'm sure your educator will be more than willing to um, share the memos with you at a later stage. So please make sure that you carry on working through these question papers. So measurements for me is one of the most um, poorly answered questions in the exam. I don't know if it's because learners don't like it or they find it difficult or whatever the case is, but measurement comprises of different sections. So you've got your basic conversions like we're doing now. We've got temperature, we've got um, time. And then also the, the part where I find the learners struggle will be 
your your perimeter, your area, your surface area, and your volume. So that's for me where the learners tend to struggle the most. So these are the more um, basic conversions um, that the learners are fine with. But then as you start getting onto perimeter and area and all those things, the learners start to struggle. So please again practice measurements because it is an area where the learners seem to struggle. So this question over here says that Aunt Abby will bake the wedding cake. So I'm assuming this is now part of an old question that's just carried on, okay, because now we've already decided someone's getting married. We don't even know who, but we know Aunt Abby's making the cake. So she'll be using a recipe from her recipe book that was published in England. Okay, great. So now we are looking at imperial. So like I said earlier on, the metric conversion system, you are expected to know, but imperial, we will give you the conversion factor as given now in this question. So one kilogram is 2.25 pounds and then one milliliter of flour is equal to 0.7 um, grams of flour. So that's also a metric conversion at the bottom, but because it's a little bit out of the ordinary, they've gone and given it to you. So if Aunt Abby needs three and a half pounds of butter, you need to determine the mass of butter in kilograms. So I went through this on Tuesday. Um, I explained the process with exchange rates. So I'll just go through it again. But I did do this on Tuesday when I went through the exchange rates. So how we can do it is you start off by writing down the conversion factor. So one kilogram is equal to 2.25 pounds. Okay. So you start off by writing down the conversion factor. One kilogram is equal to 2.25 pounds. Your next step that you're going to do is you're going to line up the same units of measurement as given to you uh, in the question. So the three and a half pounds of butter. So 3.5 pounds. And then you have a question mark because you want to know how many kilograms there are. And then you do your new value over your old value times your lonely value. Okay, or if you do that um, other method I showed you, where you always start on the right hand side, you work anti-clockwise and you always say divide first and then times so if you want to go that route as well. So you're going to say the 3.5 divided by the 2,25 and you get to an answer of 1.556 kilograms. Okay, so these are all sort of the same style of question. Aunt Abby only has a kitchen scale available. If Aunt Abby needs 625 milliliters of flour, determine the mass of the flour in grams. So again, we're gonna follow the same steps. So your first step is you write down the conversion factor that's given in the test. So one mil of flour is equal to 0.7 grams of flour. Your second step is that you line up the same units of measurements. So the 625 will come under this side. And now you see this one's changing from the top one. Okay, so the previous one, the question mark was on the left-hand side. This one is on the right-hand side. So it's showing you uh, actually quite nicely now how you would go about this. So you're going to say the new one over the old one times the lonely one. So in other words, 6 625 apologies divided by 1 multiplied by 0,7 and you get a total of 437.5 grams. If you're going to use the LVN method, then you always start, like I said here in this one, you always start on the right-hand side, and you work your way anti-clockwise. So you start on the right, so 3.5 divided by that times that. Now, remember, you follow the same steps. So you always start on the right-hand side, which is now obviously this one. So you see the previous one, we had to start at the 3.5. But this one, it's now blank. So we're going to start here. So you always start on the right. You work your way anti-clockwise. And you say divide and times. So look how it's slightly different from one another. But again, if you just always follow these steps, you can get these questions right quite easily. So start on the right, anti-clockwise, divide and times. And you'll get to the exact same answer. So that's a nice method that I recently learned from one of the educators. So um if you prefer that method, then please um, use that method as well. And then the last question of this question, and then I'll just check if there's any more questions because I see now it's already one o'clock, um, is the temperature. Okay, so another um, measurement question, another type of measurement question. And again, 
the formula will always be given to you in a test or exam, but sometimes they might swap it around as well and give it to you with the subject of the formula different. But this one they didn't. They were nice to us, paper one style. And you had to just substitute the 356 degrees Fahrenheit um, into the formula. So 356 minus the 32. And then you just had to go and divide by 1.8. And then you get a total of 180 degrees Celsius. So those were um, from paper one. And all of these were level two questions, okay? Basic conversions, but again, nice level two questions. So we're ticking off some nice level two questions for something that I hope are bonus marks.